everybody. Welcome back to the Brandon and Joe podcast. Uh, we have a special episode for you guys today. Uh, usually we just have one guest, uh, but today we have three guests. We decided a student panel would be a really cool opportunity for IO students to hear different perspectives about the field. Uh, Brandon and I joke because we actually came up with this in a Uber <laughs> and we thought, <laughs> who thought it would be here today? Um, so before we get started, we have a couple questions for you guys today. But we're going to start out with a quick little introduction. Uh, so, Ali, do you think you could start us out with just, oh, your name, uh, what school you attend, and uh, your current position? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Brent and Joe, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, like you said, my name is Ali, and I'm currently attending at NYU, the Master's I.O. program. I'm a second year, um, and I am actually an active duty Army officer. Um, I'll go next. Uh, my name is Allison Casey. I am an alum of Baruch College, where I studied IO psychology, and I am currently a training coordinator at a law firm. And I'm uh, Rohan Ramesh. I go to Hofstra University. I just graduated with my master's from there, and I'm going back for my PhD. And I'm a consultant at E. Rogers Associates. Awesome. I'm really excited to hear from you guys today. Uh, if you guys are Day one, Brando and Joe podcasters. Maybe you'll remember Allison Casey back from, I don't know. That must have been what, like the third episode, second episode. Look how far we've come. <laughs> uh, but all right, so we'll get started with our first question. Uh, it is, what was the biggest influence that led you to pursue a graduate degree in IO um, over a different degree? Um, I will go first. Uh, and... I've kind of told this story a few times, but I always knew that I wanted to do psychology, but I knew that I didn't want to do therapy. I am just one of those people who will take things home with them and just kind of marinate with it. So I knew that was never what I wanted to do. So I actually landed on onet.com back in 2014, saw that IO psychology had a positive outlook, saw that it had a pretty decent salary attached to it. And it seemed like a really great way for me to take my passion about psychology that I've had for basically my whole life, um, and turn a career out of it. So I'm really happy with how it's turned out so far. Yeah, I'll go next. Um, so my path is a little weird compared to a lot of others. Um, so I actually used to work in politics. I graduated uh, with a degree in political science um, in my undergrad, and I ended up working um, in politics for about five years. I did multiple things, like I worked in a campaign. Um, I worked in like four campaigns, actually. I, I worked in the state legislature. I worked in Congress for a little bit. So I was kind of like all over the place. And I had different jobs. Um, my last job was as a chief of staff for a state legislator in Virginia. Um, that was actually the job I really wanted, like throughout my entire career. It was like a great job, you know, really great benefits and everything. Good job security, because in politics, there's no job security at all. Um, and I, I thought I'd like it, but then I just realized I didn't really like what I was doing anywhere and I wanted to switch my career. I was actually thinking about getting an MBA. Um, I mean, I wasn't just thinking about it. I was actually studying for the GRE and I even took it a couple times. Um, but I was just thinking about it and I was like, if I do get an MBA, what, it, what exactly do I want to do? Um, and I kept going back to psychology. I never studied it in undergrad. I didn't study it in high school or anything, but I always loved psychology. Uh, so I was thinking, like, what is kind of like the avenue between like, you know, psychology and business and IO seemed to be like the perfect thing. So just went ahead with it. Um, and I'm I'm really glad I did. Um, I'll jump in last. So similar to Rohan, I have kind of a non-traditional path. Um, I'm actually an active duty army, army officer. So I've been serving in the military for the last eight years. And it's a... Uh, it's a, it's a whirlwind, but the Army does try to kind of give you breaks, give you pauses to um, give back to the community and also to kind of build up your own skill set. Um, so a couple years ago, I heard about a program where you can go to West Point to teach cadets. Um, and being a West Point grad myself, I was super interested in that. I was actually a psychology undergrad um, at West Point, and I reached back to some of my instructors and I was like, Hey, is this, is this program legit? Will the, will the army actually pay for me to go to grad school and then come back and teach? And they were like, yep, all you got to do is like jump through a million hoops. Um, so the process started uh, a couple of years ago and it was slow, but 
they once they finally approved me it was in the social psychology bucket but it was an absolute nightmare trying to find a two-year master program um, for social psychology so one of my instructors just recommended similar to Casey like recommended searching IO programs I knew nothing about IO uh, when I applied to NYU and in hindsight it is the perfect fit for me um, so I'm, I'm super happy to have found my way here yeah, that's that's awesome, like hearing all of the different paths and all of you guys are obviously strategically in different programs that we all that we picked. Um, so hearing about all this, too, like it's cool because all of you kind of fell into it in different ways. And I think that that's a really good way for us to kind of go into our next question is like picking the school that you went to. So why did you guys pick your current university over others? Like what stood out to you for your specific program that you had? Yeah, I'll start. So um, it was so when I when I like I was actually like this a couple of weeks ago, I was actually just looking back and like when I was applying to schools and everything and when I decided I wanted to go. Um, I had a list of schools like, you know, that I really wanted to to go to for I.O. Um, for like reasons. I, I mean, like Personally, like when I was looking at a university, I wanted somewhere that kind of had like a balance between the practical side of like IO and the research side. So I kind of wanted to get a little bit of both. And I know universities are like all over the spectrum. So like one university may be very research focused and another is just very, you know, practical and um, applicable. And it's just really about like what you want out of your degree and what you want out of your career. And I kind of wanted to get something in the middle. Um, and so I had my list and Hofstra was actually pretty high up on the list. It was actually like on the top of the list. Um, but this was back in 2021 uh, when I, so when I, I was still in politics and around like February of that year, that's when I found, really found out about IO and decided I wanted to do it. And so I, I was like doing my research in schools and I figured I was going to spend another year in politics and apply in the next cycle. But then I just called Hofstra. You know, I was calling schools, just asking about things. And I called up Hofstra and they were like, our application window is still open. And this was like maybe March. And I was like, fine, I'll just, you know, just throw my application in just for the fun of it and see what happens. Um, I don't have to go if I get in. You know, I can just go do it and see what happens. And then funny enough, like a month later, I got in and I was like, I don't really want to waste another year. Hofstra is like very high up on my list. Um, it has everything I want. Uh, and I do also want to, like, kind of get out of, like, the D.C. area where I was living in. I wanted to, like, you know, go out and, you know, living in New York is seems like a really great place for me. So, um, yeah, I just went ahead with it. So in the span of, like, three months, I went from not knowing what I was going to do with my life to deciding I'm going to quit my job, you know, lose my salary and then go into grad school and just move across the country. And I'm really glad I did it. I have, like, no regrets at all. I think it was one of the best decisions I've ever made. Um, and I will follow up. Similarly, I kind of cast a wide net, if you will. And I kind of also decided I thought I wanted to be in New York City. Uh, it's pretty close to West Point where I'll be teaching. So I wanted to be in the same er area as long as possible. Um, and I was kind of deciding between NYU and Columbia. Couldn't really make up my mind. Um, and I think what really sold me on NYU ultimately was kind of the same feeling that it was very balanced. Um, I am not your IO psychologist that's going to be a data analyst. It's not my strong suit. It wasn't an undergrad. I knew it wasn't going to be. And I knew if someone didn't force me to take statistics and research methods, like I wasn't going to do it on my own. Um, so it did really appeal to me that NYU talks about the scientist practitioner method, but they really mean it. And that the core courses are pretty much evenly split between those two buckets of I and O um, because again, I kind of need someone to like fo force my hand in terms of like coding and getting, getting a baseline to do my due diligence and understand all parts of IO. Um, and then the second piece is I really do feel like NYU does a great job of simulating what the industry is going to be like um, in every single one of my classes, there is a group project. Um, with practical applications. So either the instructor, you know, makes up a very realistic case study based on their own business acumen, or we, we have real world clients. Um, and I think that's helpful for both understanding what it's going to be like in, in the business world after the degree, and also just 
figuring out how to be an IO psychologist and get along with different types of people in a, in a group setting and, and work well together on teams. Nice. Um, yeah, I have, a, I grew up in New York, so I knew I wanted to stay in New York. I wasn't totally interested in completely relocating. So my main priority was something that I could afford uh, and stay kind of close to New York. So the SUNY and the CUNY system is perfect for that. I'm a huge proponent of the New York City uh, state schools and city schools. So I only applied to Albany and Baruch, and I did my Albany application first. It wasn't that great. I got rejected, but I didn't really care. And so I just put all of my hope and dreams into Baruch, and fortunately, I did get accepted. Um, so that was really great because Baruch was kind of my top choice, especially once I got rejected from Albany. Um, and yeah, I personally, I feel like I had a little bit of a different experience in terms of what the experience was like than what Allie has mentioned, but you guys can go to that first episode with me in the Brando and Joe podcast to hear all about that experience. Thank you for the shout out. We appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> but those are really three great answers. Um, while they're all IO programs, each school has a different kind of unique take on whether it's the classes you take, the projects you do. Uh, so kind of, Ali, like Anne, to your point, knowing what you like and what you want to improve on and get better at, and then matching that with the school descriptions and Rohan, how you said you called up the schools, uh, it's important to kind of take those steps to find what school is the best fit for you. So there's three great answers. Um, our next you know, question I, is... I don't mean to interrupt. Oh, I, just, I was just thinking about no, it as ahead. I was hearing like, all your guys' answers. You know what's really cool, at least within the IO field? I feel like people go to different schools, but they're, we're also kind of like one big community. Like, you know, no matter like what school you're in, like you'll meet other people from other schools and it's all like, we're kind of in like the own, our own like little small world. So I think that kind of like camaraderie is really cool. I didn't really see that. No in, one like, else you know, knows who we school. are. <laughs> no one else <laughs> yeah. knows what IO is or what we do. <laughs> yeah, there's like six of us. It's like the five of us here, then one other person. <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's a really great point. We, Brandon and I were just talking about this um, on a previous episode. While IO is such a small niche, uh, but there's so many people in it. And why that, what I mean is there's not a lot of people in the field, but when you meet someone in the field, they want to help. So wh whatever company you want to work at, you could probably try to find that one IO person. And if likely chances that you reach out to them, they're going to reach out back, which is really great about the field. Um, I don't know if you could really say the same about other fields, I've never been in other fields, so I don't know. I have another point right on that, but you just said, Joe. So funny enough, um, when I was in politics, every little you know young political staffer wants to work on the Hill, like work, wants to work in Congress. And you're trying to like network and trying to meet with people and you're sending like LinkedIn messages and like most of the time people don't want to do anything with you. But then funny enough in PSYOP when we're, when we're there, I'm like, I'm not in politics anymore, but there was a person in IO who works in Congress and, you know, I reached out to them after PSYOP. I was like, hey, I saw you there. And it was really cool that you, you spoke and he, re he actually reached back and he wanted to talk to me. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just like that IO thing, like it just kind of connects us and everyone wants to talk to everyone. No, you're, you're right on the point. Everyone has a different background, but if you find that similar background in IO, it just connects you even more. Um, and that networking aspect just kind of like boops. Uh, so no, it's a great point. Yeah, please interrupt me whenever you want. Something. Go ahead. Um, I think also because IO has historically always dealt with like their branding issue. I mean, we're called industrial organizational psychology. <laughs> it's not the same in other countries. Like there's a lot of branding issues. So I feel like for the people who are really interested and passionate about IO and really into the idea of networking and progressing their self themselves as a professional in the IO community, that you get all of these really tightly banned um, communities all across the internet. Like uh, IO coffee breaks, um, the IO pop-up networking that happens on LinkedIn, Metro in New York City, which I'm a huge fan of and a volunteer of. Um, so I don't know about the other ones scattered around the states, but already there's a few just off the top of my head. And I think that it's almost like one of the bad things about IO can be one of the good things about IO. Mm -hmm. Do you think we'll ever get a new name or are we just going to be this mouthful for well, the rest of the Well, in Europe, they call it a, isn't it workplace psychology in Europe? Like, it's... And for people who are supposed to like, you know, 
know about branding and marketing and that's one of our things. It's it's right. super I thought it was super interesting. I was like, wait, like IO is branding and marketing part <laughs> of it. So why can't we like do it for ourselves? Yeah. It was it's funny, like I was just talking with another IO about this and we like do so much research and like talk so much about burnout, but I feel like IOs are probably the ones that get the most burnt out. <laughs> like Joe and I personally were working with Casey on a project over the summer. And then we realized that we took on way too much and we were like, we might need to take a step back. So <laughs> it's like, we can't help ourselves. It makes sense. <laughs> I, I totally haven't even thought about that project too. I've been very much enjoying taking a little break from it. <laughs> Maybe one day in the future, Definitely. but uh, yeah. We are IOs. We're going to circle back. Don't, don't, we're, <laughs> don't doubt that. <laughs> the break was needed. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, there, there are some great points. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. Um, so our third question is, what is one of your favorite courses and projects uh, and how, how did it help you prepare for your current position or just the workforce in general? Um, so I'll lead this one off. Interestingly enough, uh, based on my previous comments, statistics was actually my favorite course so far. And I think for me, it was super rewarding because it was first semester and I had never done any sort of coding. I graduated undergrad in 2015. They were still using SPSS. Uh, now R is a thing. And I had very limited experience previously. Um, so I think like building a tangible skill was huge for me, especially first semester of grad school, just like helping build confidence and then seeing how I could rely on my peers and the TA to kind of like get me there. Um, and, and to your point, Casey, like everyone was so willing to like pull me across the finish line and it, it did take a lot of pulling uh, for sure. And a lot of like late night study sessions, but it was awesome seeing how these people that I just met were so willing to like share their knowledge with me and literally sit and look at my code line by line until we can make it work. So um, yeah, it, it was really rewarding. I kind of have like a similar answer, like statistics isn't like the popular answer. Um, I was like thinking about this question and it's, it's, yeah, it's like funny because like when I look back into like my master's program now, um, there were like a lot of classes that were like fun, you know, or more fun than others because you learn a lot of cool things and it's just like the actual stuff like, you know, that really interests you. Um, and I was thinking of like maybe picking one of those classes, but I think now that I look back at it, I think the class that actually had the most impact in me was research methods. Um, and maybe maybe that's why I'm in a PhD program. Maybe I'm just a nerd. <laughs> you know, I just really liked it. Um, but like, you know, when I was actually doing it, I hated it because it's it was probably like one of the hardest classes I've ever taken in my life. Um, you know, it's just so, I mean, it's research methods. Like anyone who's taken it knows, knows how tough it is. Um, and I, I didn't like it at all doing it. There was just so much like studying and so many things to learn and just all these like, you know, I don't know, just like all these rules and like, it was just crazy. But then after like, you know, I, so I did that in like my second semester of my first year. Um, and I started working at E. Rogers around that time. I found that the way, you know, research methods like teaches you how to use like the scientific process it actually really like it transformed how I approached everything, especially at work and even outside of work. Like I'm like approaching things like, you know, starting with like, you know, coming up with an object, like finding an observation and then like, you know, developing a hypothesis, gathering information and then just going through that whole process and just doing that kind of like structure. It doesn't even you don't even have to be like, you know, doing an experiment. You don't have to do like actual research, but just doing it at work just made my work, a, you know, better quality. Um, it, I think like, you know, especially if you're in consulting where there's like a lot of ambiguity and you're not really told what to do, you kind of have to figure it out yourself. Having that structure really helped me a lot. Um, and even like now, and again, maybe I'm just a nerd and that's why I went into the PhD program, but just everything I look, anything I see, like that's not even related to IO. I just look at it from like the scientific like process. So, um, yeah, I think that's probably my favorite looking back at it just because it had such a huge impact. It's definitely a really nerdy answer. Um, <laughs> yeah. Rohan, you might like this book, uh, Think Again by Adam Grant. It's a book. Yes, that I read that over the winter. That was one of my favorite books I've ever oh, read. Really? I love that book so much. It's so good. Yeah, it was really good. 
And so for any of the viewers, if this gets uh, included, uh, Think Again is a book by Adam Grant, who's an IO psychologist. And the book is basically all about what Rohan was just talking about, which is approaching the world in everyday scenarios with the brain of a scientist and thinking about how you can kind of turn everything into a little experiment so you can stay more open-minded. What's really funny about that I is the Army also has a process called MDMP, the military decision-making process, because we have to make everything an acronym. And it's, it's basically exactly that, too. It's just taking any problem that you have to solve and using the scientific method, essentially. We just had to create our own acronym and build our own more confusing steps into it. So. When I look back at it, I wish I had this. I wish I had this in politics because they don't use a scientific process at all for anything. And I feel like they could use it a little bit, um, just the way they approach everything. And so I have like a little bit of like regret that I wish I'd learned this back when I used to work there. Yeah, that's interesting. That could be like the competitive edge of a politician <laughs> to take that approach. Yeah. Um, my favorite course from Baruch is kind of also similar vein. It's not one of the math courses because unfortunately I'm going to put money on the fact that it was a public university that we didn't have the funds or the funds to obtain the expertise in the professor to teach R or anything like that. So we stayed with SPSS, which I was familiar with from undergrad. So that wasn't my favorite course, but my favorite course was work-life balance. And that's because of the scientist practitioner model, which is kind of similar to what Ali and Rohan are talking about. But so work-life balance was a course that I took in the winter which similar to what we were just saying before, um, I ironically was taking this course and felt like I had no work-life balance whatsoever, but the class was really interesting. So it made it easier. And so the reason why I think that was my favorite course is just because the research inspired me so much and it felt so practical and it felt so tangible to be applied in the workplace that it really just illuminated the scientist scientist practitioner model for me. So I ended up doing a few blog posts for the company that I was working with, just taking some of the insights from those research articles that I was reading. Um, and I think that's exactly, it's like a good culmination of exactly what I like about IO. So that's my, that's my favorite course. Oh, wow. I wish, I wish Hofstra had a work-life balance course. That would be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I mean, I can just send you the articles and that was the class because <laughs> we just read the articles, did blog posts and then like one project. Oh, please do. No, I I think um, you guys all mentioned, it's kind of interesting how like it was in a similar vein to like the classes that you guys all talked about had some sort of like scientific background. Like when we take like our organizational psychology course, like at, at Hofstra, there obviously is like the science behind it, but it's not like the meticulous science, like with the statistics or a research method. Like that type of stuff is a lot more rigid than the stuff that you look at in OSYC. So Hearing you guys all talk about your experiences in school and like your most valuable classes, I'm really interested that like all of them were like the really stats heavy, like research methods portions. So that's really cool. Um, yeah, you got a bunch and of nerds on here. Taking that and look. Bunch uh, of nerds. I said you have a bunch of nerds on your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes, as we do. And, and I know that, um, and the cool thing too, about research methods and stats and like all these classes that you guys are talking about is like that practical experience. Like you can kind of see where those come into play once you start working and like, we can kind of change that like view of how we look at the workplace. So from, through those classes you guys took, I'm sure that you guys probably saw that helping you out. It's a good transition, um, to talk about like just some tips. So our next question we have for you guys is like tips or advice that you would give incoming students, like looking to make the most out of their time as like an IO student. So this could be like job help or class help, or even like networking advice, like, et cetera, like anything like that. Um, yeah, I can start with this one. Um, so for, especially since I went to a public school, uh, they don't have too many frills. So my advice for someone going to really any graduate program, but especially a public uh, funded program is to that it's going to be whatever you make of it. So if you can, don't just go into it, just trying to kind of get in, get out, get the degree. Of course, in some scenarios, that's all you really can do. And that's totally understandable. But if you can try to go into it, just knowing that you're going to be challenged by professors 
try to be open-minded and getting inspired by your classmates and then stay open-minded for how you can kind of surprise yourself in different ways. Like maybe do things that you're not that comfortable with, like volunteering for a student board or just sending some of those LinkedIn messages if you're not that comfortable with it. Like we've been saying on the call already, the whole IO community is very friendly for the most part. Of course, you're going to get some no's, but we all kind of really like helping each other out. And the last piece of advice is the fact that if you're a graduate student, that might be the last time that you're a student. So it's the last time you can pull the student card and everyone loves helping students. It just feels very digestible. It's like, okay, this is a student. They need a little bit of help. I can do that. So use the card, take the nose, just assume good intentions and keep on keeping on. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, yeah, I think my advice would kind of be a little similar. Um, when, if you're like going into like, I mean, I, I guess this would probably apply to like any sort of graduate course, but you know, especially in IO, um, it's not going to be easy. Like, I think people understand that, like, you know, you're going to go into a rigorous course and you're going to learn a lot of heavy stuff. Um, so I think what helped me a lot was leaning on others during my entire master's program. Like, you know, we would do a lot of like study sessions together. Um, we would, you know, talk about what we're learning in class, if we had any questions and obviously like the professors too, like, you know, talking to them as much as we can um, really help. Uh, I mean, I, I know like that's kind of like the sort of like advice everyone gives and it's just like, oh yeah, we hear that all the time. But I mean, it really is true. Like I didn't, in my like undergrad or, you know, even in high school or whatever, I didn't really like study with other people. Uh, and I mean, I did fine, but you know, when I came to grad school, I just realized like I was just, like doing a lot more team stuff and doing a lot more, you know, study sessions with other people. And I saw my grades just instantly get better. And it's cause, you know, I, I don't know, maybe there's probably a scientific way. Maybe we should do like a study on it, but I think, you know, you just kind of like are more invested in it when you're with someone else, you're like learning what you know, maybe they have a certain perspective on something and you don't have that. And that kind of like helps you learn it. Um, one of the most effective things that uh, we did, you know, among like our little like group study sessions was actually simulating like teaching something, you know, in front of the group. And so if we had like, you know, an exam coming up like a midterm and we learned like, you know, maybe five topics and there's five of us here, like there was five classes throughout that up until the midterm, um, we would all like pick one class that we each had like the most trouble with. So like whatever thing that you really need help, like learning, you don't really know that much, you would be the professor for that thing. So it kind of forces you to like actually really learn that topic when you're up there in front of everyone and you're trying to like teach them, you know, what's going on. You have to like actually really know it. And it's, I, I didn't, you know, we kind of like stumbled onto it, but I, you know, I think later on we did like read a research study that says like, if you're trying to like learn something, actually trying to teach it makes you learn it even better. So, um, I know that's kind of like a crazy, like long winded answer, but yeah, I mean, I thought that was like one of the most effective things that I gained from the master's program. Um, as far as like jobs, I know it's like a really stressful thing. Like, you know, it's everyone needs a job, like, you know, you, you need a job out of grad school and it's, it's really tough. Um, I would say like, try not to stress out about it as much until like, you know, it's time to apply. And obviously, you know, you need to apply when you need a job and, you know, you don't want to just like put it away. Uh, and especially if, you know, I know a lot of folks have full-time jobs, you know, during during the, during the their school because they need to get money to afford school. Um, and I was one of those folks. So, you know, you got to do what you, you have to do. But I think our community is tight-knit. So reach out to folks like, you know, in your program. Reach out to alumni from your school. Reach out to other people you meet. Um, you can even just reach out to random people who are in I.O. I've done that before and they've actually responded back. Um, like we said earlier, like it's a very tight knit community. So just, you know, networking and just, you know, there's, there's no like really like easy way. You just go and send a message and then hopefully they'll get back and then you talk with them and then that leads to a job eventually. So yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'd say. Yeah, I definitely agree that one of my biggest tips, you guys kind of stole my, my thunder, but um, one of my biggest tips was also going to be just making sure you you take the time to reach out um because i know that's one thing i was afraid to do and it's like you said casey the student card right it's it's super easy it's 
not as awkward as you'd think it'd be um, because people are so willing to help in our community. And I do think it can go a long way, even if you just send a message while you're in school and then a couple of years down the road, you remember someone and you're like, oh, we connected four or five years ago. Like maybe I want to transition into that field or maybe I'm looking for a job now. So I do think um, just kind of putting your your pride aside, um, if that's what it is, your awkwardness, whatever it is for you personally, and and making the time to kind of reach out. Um, and then the second thing I kind of thought of was setting goals. And I know that's a pretty generic statement, but for me personally, I, especially because this was a time where I knew I could be a full-time student, I hit the ground running. I was like, I'm attack everything. Um, NYU actually has like all the frills, which can be overwhelming and like too much. So I was trying to do too much. I was trying to attend all these like Zoom seminars and do schoolwork and network and go to drinks with my peers. And like, it was a lot. And I bit off more than I could chew. And like midway through the semester, I kind of sat down and I was like, okay, like what are the three things I want to get out of this semester? Um, Because we're all very type A proactive individuals in IO. I think it is very common, whether you're a full-time student or part-time to like want to just get after it. Um, But know that like you will get, you will get a lot out of it, but just set aside that time to set very like deliberate goals and reflect on those goals at kind of maybe the end of every semester and, and see where you're at and where you want to go next semester. Yeah, some wonderful pieces of advice. Um, Casey and Allie, to your point about reaching out, I definitely want to emphasize using that student card. Uh, you only have, but depending how long you're in the program for, two years to use it and use it to your full, as much as you can. <laughs> um, people will answer you if you just put in the subject line. You can just go get a PhD and then just hold off on your dissertation. You know, and then just <laughs> or yeah, get a couple just more extend years. extend it forever. <laughs> Well, people will. People will answer if you put in the subject line, uh, IO student looking for advice or, you know, something along those lines. Um, people love to talk about what they do, especially to students in the field. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's great advice. And then, uh, Rohan, to your piece about like the classwork in general, um, I know there's a whole bunch of people that come from different backgrounds, but from those select few that come right from undergraduate to graduate, and honestly, even from anybody, uh, it's a different sort of feel the type of work that you get. Uh, The undergraduate work is, I would say, a little bit less uh, intensive than your master's work because they expect a little bit more out of you. Um, I know one of our first classes, I think half the class bombed. I was one of them, (laughs) one of our midterms. Uh, And you have to kind of realize like, oh, I kind of have to settle down and make sure I get my stuff done. It was uh, one of our OD classes. He's a wonderful professor, uh, but uh, it was uh, definitely a test that you have to makes you change your mind. You're like, oh, this is this is master's now. Mm-hmm. No, it's not undergraduate. I also just want to say that I really love Allie's point about uh, setting goals every semester, especially the fact that she specified like three goals. That sounds super manageable. And it sounds like a great thing where you can kind of think like maybe like health, friends, like studies, and you try to kind of keep all of those things going just so that you know you're doing, you know that you're moving the needle, but you're not burning yourself out because I could, I totally see what Ali's talking about where you can just try to bite off way too much because you're so excited and um, it's not sustainable. So great, great point, Ali. Oh yeah. I was, I was just like running myself ragged. And to be clear, one of those three goals was to go out for drinks once a week. So you're right. It, it was about balance. Two goals were like school. <laughs> one goal was like mental health, but <laughs> That's networking. <laughs> I keep saying it, but it, that's like another nice thing about our community. And I and I, I keep going back to like my old like life in politics. Like we we're like run ragged in politics and no one ever talks about it. Like no one talks about burnout. You're just expected to stay in the office all day, all night, every day, no weekends off. Um, and if you just even bring it up, it's kind of like a taboo thing. It's like, do you actually really care about politics? Do you care about helping people? Do you actually want to work? Um, and it's just really weird. But in IO, um, we work really hard. Like we do a lot, you know, it's not that we're just like, you know, just sitting around, we do a lot, but we actually are open to talking about our burnout and we're open to talking about balancing our life 
with our work. And that's just another reason why I feel like this community especially is healthier than other ones. Honestly, Rohan, that's scary similar to the military. And one of my biggest takeaways and my biggest like personal goals is taking like that concept of it's okay to talk about it back to the workplace because people in the military just grind too. And it's, it's not good for you. People age so fast. They're so tired. Like they're not producing their best work. Their family life goes to shit behind the scenes. And it's, if you can just like open up that door to just get people to talk about it, I think in any, any place, but especially maybe in, in politics and in the military, it'll do like leaps and bounds for the culture. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's not even like a crazy thing. Like we learned it. There was just like a study, like in the early 1900s, they said, if you actually take time off of work, you actually be going to be more productive. So <laughs> yeah. Europeans with their siesta have it going on. <laughs> yeah. Four day work weeks studied by Rohan Ramesh. <laughs> coming to you soon. <laughs> uh, I know. I, I didn't even think burnout personally could affect me. And then and, until it actually happens, I was like, oh, I'll just do everything as much as I can. I won't get burned out. Like, that's not me. And then you do. And you're like, oh, I, I got to take this seriously and make sure. Because yeah. you're right. It's You won't perform at your best. Um, I know me and Brandon, when we have a lot going on with the podcast, uh, if we don't, like, take that time to, like, think and relax – uh, the episodes won't be as good, our like output and our questions, and you definitely have to take the time, 100%. Yeah. And okay, so for our last question, uh, we have briefly talk about what your current position is, um, how you got it, and what you do. I will uh, start this one off. So as I've alluded many times, I'm active duty Army. I'm actually a helicopter pilot by trade. I've been doing that for about the last eight years. I've held a bunch of jobs with titles you guys wouldn't recognize, but they're essentially just like anywhere from a department manager to a senior manager. Um, I've done some staff work, basically like operations. So in charge of anywhere from 30 to 350 people, depending on the job. So it's been an awesome experience so far. Um, The Army actually owns me until 2030 so i get this this break to go to grad school which is awesome and then i get to help give back by going to teach psychology to west point cadets for a couple years um, and then kicked back out to the army to hopefully share my awesome insight about burnout uh, with everybody else but i think moving forward after the army i could absolutely see myself doing something like consulting or executive coaching I do think what I really like about IO is that it's so diverse and there are things that I can apply to my personal life, my army life, things that I'm hoping to like teach cadets when I get to that point. Um, And then also very applicable to the outside world. I think my focus is kind of like leadership group dynamics, um, potentially some executive coaching when I get out. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, Yeah, that sounds really nice. And I also love IO because of how diverse it is. Um, I think I'll, I think I'll return back to that statement. Um, (laughs) I'll start with what my current position is. Uh, So just last month, I started as a training coordinator, uh, and I'm working with a law firm. So it's kind of a niche uh, industry. But similar to what Rohan experienced with politics, and maybe Ali with uh, the military, or the army, I'm sorry. Um, it's, it's, there's a lot of really hard workers and there's a lot of burnout. So it's really uh, an interesting opportunity for me to have some of these conversations about things like burnout. And what's really nice is I'm on a team, since we're the training for the firm, um, I'm on a team that really supports having conversations like that. We're having conversations with external consultants all the time about how to bring in conversations about DEI, uh, well-being, time management, different things like that. So I love being on a team where that is our main objective is to support our associates enough so that they can bring their best selves to work. And so as we've mentioned, you can't really do that if you're totally spread thin. So um Another thing I wanted to mention about this role was the fact that I 
the way that I got the role was actually somebody reaching out to me on LinkedIn because they had my resume held on from a few years prior where I applied to a role through a staffing agency who also reached out to me. So they, the, the company itself held on to my resume, reached out to me with a role that I wasn't completely interested in, but it had the title of professional development coordinator. So I was like, let me just see what this is all about. And I really hate interviewing. So when I had the opportunity to just practice some interviews, I was all for it. And then fortunately, over the interview process, since I kept saying yes, the job description eventually evolved into a very hyper-specific training role, which was ultimately just a training and development role, which is so much more IO than it was in the beginning. So I was really happy that I decided to stick with it. Um, and so in terms of future aspirations, um, I'm not exactly sure where the role is going to take me. I was previously in an internship where it was very macro level. I was doing organizational cultural work. And so a lot of the times our suggestions would be things would include things like, oh, well, we need to have trainings over here. We have to do a statement of work to get an external tra uh, trainer to come in. Maybe we should add a coaching component. And so it was all very large, big macro scale. But since I had never had the work experience of doing the nitty gritty of the micro details, I kind of fell out of my place. Of course, I was in an internship, so it was just a great opportunity for me to even be in the room and have those conversations. But in terms of having my first full time benefits salaried role after graduation, I was really excited about the idea of kind of taking everything down a step and going to that micro level so I could see what it is like to put on a training and especially for a whole organization and what goes into that. So now that I'm connecting with more external consultants, I'm keeping an eye on what their life looks like. Like maybe one day I'll be the trainer, um, but I'm still figuring out that out. And so that's why I was saying that I really liked Ali's point about how diverse IO is because I don't, I don't have to stay in training forever. I can just rock out this role until we don't clash or until we don't click anymore. And then there's so many more possibilities with IO. So very diverse uh, and very applicable major that I'm very happy with. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I think um, like I'm just going to like reiterate what you guys said. Like it's like IO is like you can go so many different ways and you, you're not necessarily just stuck in one area. Like you can go explore. Um, like I mentioned in the beginning, I'm a consultant and I work for the Rogers Associates, it's a small boutique firm in Connecticut, um, really small, it's like less than 10 people. So um, I, I, so I, I am a consultant, but like the world of consulting itself is huge and it's very different depending on who you work for. There's a lot of the big firms like um, KPMG and life there is much different than life for a small consultant like me. Um, I mean, we do like similar things, but, you know, just just that size aspect really changes a lot. Um, and so I've been like I've been trying to think of like, you know, what exactly I do. Um, Brandon and Joe, I don't know if you remember, like this was like early on in your first semester. Um, I came and talked with like your entire class about like what I do. And I think the question I asked was, what do you guys think a consultant does? Um, and I remember like everyone was like shouting out different things. And then I think one person just said um, they do everything. And that's kind of true. It's like a consultant will do like pretty much anything and everything like, you know, out there. Um, and like really like you can you can get consultants in really sort of any field. So it's just a very like big, broad topic. Um, now, specifically with our firm, we are an I.O. based firm. My boss is trained in I.O. Um, you know, everyone, most people in the firm is also trained in IO. And so we really know that subject. And so we work a lot with HR departments in, in other companies and we apply a lot of IO solutions. Um, I think we do like a lot of, we, we kind of have it in like two buckets, our, our work. So we have like the executive coaching stuff. Uh, so my boss will will speak with uh, clients and organizations and they'll she'll help like, you know, be an executive coach with them. And my job is a supporter, um, you know, to provide like, you know, research in our field. Um, other things like a lot of one of the most common things I do with with our clients um, is they'll do a lot of uh, assessments. Um, one of the one of the most famous ones is the Hogan. I think um, everyone knows what, what that is. It's a really great leadership assessment. Um, and if you don't know what it is, you should go look it up because it's one of the best out there. 
Um, and so a lot of our clients will, will have done the Hogan. And so my job is to kind of like look at their assessment and sort of analyze their results and then provide like feedback based on that. Um, Hogan does already provide feedback based on your, your, um, your score. So it's good there, but our job is to like, take it a step further and, you know, we'll, we'll speak with them, you know, talk about their whole life story, talk about what issues they're going through at work. And so I'll take that information. I'll take their assessment information and kind of help like provide solutions for them, whatever problems they're facing. Um, and really like, you know, whatever they're doing, we, we try and help them with that. Um, so that's the executive coaching stuff. The other stuff we do is sort of bigger projects. I think if anything, you could call it OD. So organizational development projects, we do a lot of that. Um, but that can really go at, like in sort of like many different directions. Like we could do a little project that just helps like, you know, like a small team, or we could do a project that is basically helping out an entire department in a big organization. Um, you know, a lot, some of the most common things is like, we'll develop a training program for folks. We'll do like leadership programs. One of my most favorite projects I ever did was we had a client who hired an entirely new C-suite. The CEO had only been there for maybe, I think, a year or so. And so our job was to come in um, and kind of help the C-suite become a, a really cohesive team together and help them with their, um, their organization. Um, and, you know, obviously, because there's an entire new C-suite, you can kind of tell that the organization wasn't doing too well. Um, so our job was to help them become a really effective and high performing team and make sure they can turn their company around. Uh, and so my job specifically, I was helping, um, you know, my boss uh, with that. He was the main consultant and I was uh, basically supporting as the IO expert. So I developed uh, basically a three day offsite that talked about sort of different things about how you become a high performing team. We also did assessments on on the team and we got, you know, feedback from the team members and we use that during the offsite. Um, and it was a really cool project. I didn't think like, you know, it was one of my first ones I did. I didn't know how well it was going to go because again, I was like kind of new to it. I didn't, I thought I was going to mess it up really bad, um, but it turned out to go really well. And I knew it went really well when one of the C-suite members in the offsite started crying. Like it was actually really like, we got really personal into things and that kind of helped. Like it, it was good tears, like, um, but it kind of helped like, you know, forge like a relationship among each other so it wasn't just like we were teaching them good stuff to be like you know just good workers we were actually helping them be like you know better friends with each other and that kind of helped them be a better c-suite and that was actually um more than a year ago and we like checked in and then they're actually doing really well now so you know it kind of helps to like see that sort of result like you know you do some work and then you can actually see like it actually turned out well so um yeah so that's kind of what i do as a consultant um as far as what I want to do in the future, right now, I just want to survive my doctoral program and, you know, make it out with the PhD. Uh, after that, I really don't know. I've, I've been thinking about different things. I think I'm kind of like, you know, going to stay in the consulting field. Um, one of my like really crazy aspirations was to take my IO knowledge and bring it back to politics. Um, Cause like I mentioned before, they, they don't have any of that there. They don't know what they're doing. Um, I don't want to say that there's a lot of good people in there They you know, they're really, really smart, really hardworking, but I feel like there's a lot of stuff in IO that can kind of help people in politics. Um, I mean, just for example, like the hiring process is really, really crap. Like it's, there's really not much of a hiring process. It's basically, who do you know? And, you know, based on that, you'll get a couple resumes they'll do like a, you know, five minute, like, you know, or 15 minute, like video call talking about stuff that really isn't relevant to the job or kind of is. And it's really just based off like, you know, the person hiring, whether they like you or not, and then you get the job. Um, we can kind of like go in and show them how you build a really structured hiring process so you can get people who are fit for the job. Um, so anyway, like, I know that's kind of a tangent, but that's like one of like my like very like aspirational future projects. That I don't know I'm not going to do tomorrow. Um, probably only going to do it after my doctoral program but yeah that's kind of kind of what i'm thinking about it's awesome hearing about like the different pathways you guys have all kind of forged for yourselves and you know some of the main messages that i heard were kind of like the differences and like the different things you can do in io the idea of teamwork and then like to your last point rohan like it was really just seeing the impact and all of those things i feel like are kind of what draws to io like we all kind of find our way into this path, into this field. 
and to like hear you guys mention all those things. I know a lot of us have kind of spoken with other IOs and you can kind of hear that that's kind of the same way that they fall into it. Like specifically to Rohan's point about seeing like the impact, I know um, as IOs and going back to like what Rohan was saying with research methods, like you can literally see the impact, like yeah. <laughs> you can test and see mm -hmm. the impact. So I think that that's really awesome to hear like what you guys are doing and how you kind of have forged that path for yourselves. So with that being said, I am going to summarize what we've learned today. Um, all of you guys have so many amazing points and it was so awesome to have you on here to discuss not just like your careers, but specifically like your educational careers. I think so many students are going to find value in this. I know I wish Joe and I had these types of resources when we were looking for programs because we've got three of the best, three of some of the best programs in New York City right here with NYU, Hofstra and Baruch. Um, I think that you guys did a really amazing job representing your programs and you showed that like there is not just like the scientific side to IO psychology, but also the human side. And I think that that's super, super valuable. Um, and overall, Joe and I just want to thank you all for like joining us and coming on here uh, late at night and talking with us about all this amazing IO stuff and to Rohan's point, nerding out about <laughs> it. So <laughs> we want we want to thank you guys so much. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. All right. Well, we hope you guys have a great rest of your night. Our listeners, thank you for listening. If you guys want to check out or ask these guys any questions, please, please feel free to reach out to them. They will be happy to help out. We'll put their LinkedIn's in our bios. Uh, thank you guys for everything. Thank you for listening. Thanks for joining us, guys. Thank you, Brandon. Thank and Joe. you. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you.